travelers and welcome to the traverse of the stars podcast how are my loyal listeners thank you for your continued support and as always hit that subscribe button everybody we had an amazing show for you because board the mothership is graham hamilton you know him as kalon primary and k1 on the orville now come join me as we go traversing the stars hello mr hamilton thank you so much for coming to the traverse of the stars podcast hey my pleasure good to be here totally my pleasure sir so I always start off with the question of inspiration. So what inspired your love for acting and who are your earliest influences? Wow. Um, I'm a theater kid at heart. So uh, it was a lot of the uh, the sentimental romantic comedies of the, the 1940s and 50s that really got me involved with the theater. Um, but then uh, actually growing up, uh, I uh, I fell in love with the family guy. And it was uh, a real uh, full circle getting to work on on Orville. So I've been a fan of Seth MacFarlane's for for many, many years. Um, yeah, yeah. So it was very, very cool to kind of come full circle on this project. Well, I read that you're a graduate of the prestigious Juilliard School of Acting. So what did the experience teach you about the art of acting? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I... Um, my life kind of took a 180 degree turn. I wasn't ever really intending to be a professional actor. It was something that I did in middle school and high school just for fun. I never really took it all that seriously. Um, and uh, my plan was to go off and study marine ecology. I thought I was going to be, you know, a marine biologist somewhere mm -hmm. in the Pacific Northwest. And um I was on this track, I had been accepted to a university in Northwestern Washington State. And uh, as fate would have it, um, a retired screenwriter who was living in Seattle at the time and was very good friends with the high school librarian um, came and saw a play that I was in and, and introduced himself to me afterwards and invited me out for, for tea and, um, and cookies one afternoon. And I took him up on it just to, you know, as an opportunity to meet someone who was kind of in the field and talk about the theater. And um, he, uh, and he sat me down and he's like, so what are you going to do? Like after you graduate, I said, well, I'm going to go and study marine ecology and I want to be a marine biologist. And he says, oh, okay, that's interesting. He's like, you know, you should really think about going into the theater. And I'll never forget. I said to him, I was like the theater, like how does anybody make a living in the theater? <laughs> and without missing a beat, he says, how does anybody make a living as a marine biologist? <laughs> I was like okay all right fair enough and he said you know look I think you're great here's a list of schools that I think might interest you have a look at them if anything piques your interest further I'll help you write an essay and I had been to Juilliard or I'd been to Lincoln Center where Juilliard is at in New York City the year before on a choir tour and fell in love with the city and and um, one of the schools that he'd recommended was Juilliard and I thought to myself like gosh you know Shakespeare in New York that sounds kind of cool and um I had no idea of the prestige of the school so mm -hmm. I, I really like was kind of going into it blind so um I don't think that I had you know all of the information that I could have had to psych myself out during the audition process so I was just mm -hmm. kind of going into it you know having fun really kind of carefree and I think that had everything to do with while I got um accepted but being in school this was right after you know I graduated from high school so I was on the the younger end of of other um classmates of mine and so I uh I spent the first couple of years really getting um stripped down you know and kind of uh my ideas about performance and acting were really just laid bare and and kind of eviscerated, you know. So I spent the first <laughs> couple of years just like unlearning all of the crap that I, you know, I, I thought I I knew, um, and uh, and really kind of coming around to this this general idea that like you know acting is about telling a story, and stories exist in in universes and in communities, and and uh, an actor is only as powerful as um 
his reflection onto another person or to a component of a story or a landscape or whatever is happening within a story. So it was the big thing that I think I learned at Juilliard was that like acting is not about my experience. Mm -hmm. um, it's more about the experience of the world in which this character is living and the experience of the world that um, a community of, of of uh, characters are creating on stage or on camera or whatever. Um, so it, it kind of, what started out as a very kind of like individualistic art form, you know, it was something like Graham was bringing his emotional, you know, experience to these characters and his intellect to these characters became a much more kind of communal, social, creative um, experience where it was it was less about the individual and more about the the community of building characters and story and worlds so uh, you must have done a great job because you won a helen hayes best actor award for your performance of hamlet at the folger shakespeare library now mm -hmm. that is amazing um i love shakespeare english teacher you know shakespeare's my thing so when you're performing a role like hamlet that for hundreds of years, it's had huge names attached to it. It has had great performances. Um, once again, it has the name of Hamlet and Shakespeare uh, right behind it. How do you go about finding your own voice and portraying your version of the character? Wow, I, I love that question. And I'm, I'm so happy to be talking about Shakespeare. Um, you know, I mean, being in New York, going to Juilliard, I was uh, very much focused on the classics. And... Um, Actually, while I was at school, the Shakespeare productions that we did, I always had like the tiniest role. You know, I was like murderer number one or you know, <laughs> like page or whatever. So I never really got to sink my teeth into any of the larger roles. But I was lucky in that after I graduated, I got to participate in a number of productions of Hamlet um, playing Laertes kind of across the board. I kept getting cast as Laertes. And so I had um, opportunities to work with and watch really fantastic actors grapple with their own Hamlets. So mm -hmm. like Amish Linklater, Christian Camargo. Um, and so I think I had an advantage in the sense that the play was baked into me over a number of years before I had the opportunity to, to play Hamlet myself. Um, so I was drawing on a lot, not necessarily on other performances of Hamlet, but just drawing on a deep kind of saturated understanding of the play and of the language and the world uh, that, that Shakespeare was creating. And then I think I was very lucky to have a director who was very much um, kind of going back to what I was talking about in terms of my experience going from a very individualistic actor, you know, someone who might, you know, be really excited about playing Hamlet to an actor who is really more interested in telling the story mm. of Hamlet, really representing the world of Denmark and really um, unpacking the relationships between Hamlet and Ophelia and Hamlet and Claudius, Hamlet and Horatio, Hamlet and the ghost. Um, so the director that I got to work with, Joseph Hodge, uh, we were very much simpatico in that kind of approach to the play. And again, the play, and this is true with a lot of Shakespeare, the more you give yourself over to the language, the more the actor kind of gets out of their own way and really focuses on the words. Um, I think the more kind of interesting performances we get to see and the more the d more depth of character gets revealed ultimately. So I didn't have like, a, oh, I'm going to approach Hamlet from, from this perspective or from that perspective, or I want to play him like this or that. Um, so much as I was really mostly interested in like telling the larger story, like understanding mm -hmm. that Hamlet, as big of a role as he is, he's just a piece of this much larger ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I guess I, one thing that I did really focus on um, was Hamlet's grief. I think I really f wanted to center his journey through the play um coming from a place of grief mm. uh and there's lots of different kind of you know 
colors and shades and dimensions and faces of Hamlet that are all completely valid, but underneath it all, um, it all seemed to be kind of symptomatic or issuing from this, this well of grief, I think. Now, the cool thing about Hamlet and an interesting facet of Hamlet is that he's such an emotional character. And when the story begins, the play begins, he's already had the loss of his father to deal with. He's already dealing with a lot of emotion and he still has five acts of a play left to develop. So how do you pace yourself so you're not delivering everything at the beginning, not letting yourself anywhere to go? Awesome question. Um, and it, and it is, it is challenging, right? Because he is shot out of a cannon, right? Like if right. you're doing coming from this place of grief, you're already like showing up with this huge weight, right? But Shakespeare does a really brilliant thing in that he offers Hamlet a lot of like emotional variety and, and opportunities to, to be funny, to be sarcastic, to be, um, uh, to be pointed, to be glib, all of these different kind of um, ways of expressing that grief, right? So I think during the pre-production when we were in rehearsals, it was very much about like, how many different ways can we approach this moment? And again, it had everything to do with not like, how am I going to deliver this line rather than like, how are we going to create the moment in the scene with all of the other actors who are on stage that are going to allow for the most like sharp, the sharpest, most interesting and human moment mm -hmm. in this particular spot in the play, whether it's like, you know, at the beginning when Hamlet's at court and Claudius is there, you know, lamenting the death of his brother and all of that. And Hamlet is in, you know, off on the side, rightfully upset. But how is he going to address the audience, right? How is he going to talk to his mother? How is he going to talk to his uncle? Um, so yeah, it's a it's a great question and, and a trap that I think is is very easy for all actors, myself included, to fall into. But I think again, going back to what else is happening with the other characters in this world? Who else is on stage? And how can mm -hmm. I lean into their experience? Um, in this very specific moment, in this very specific theater, very specific community, how can I leverage this moment to tell like the sharpest, clearest, most nuanced version of, mm. of the story? Now, I like how many options you have with Hamlet when you're portraying it, because there's so many different ways to read the, the story, you know, Shakespeare, his, his writing, so many to read the dialogue. Now, one inter interesting thing to look at is Hamlet and Ophelia. Now, when you're playing Hamlet, do you play it as he actually has real strong feelings of love for Ophelia, or do you play it that he is using her throughout? I think, I think far and away, he does have feelings for Ophelia. Again, like, you know, going back to this idea of like being grief stricken, I think that his relationship with Ophelia and how Ophelia is manipulated and how that gets, how that plays out with Hamlet and Polonius and everything like that is all kind of feeding into that grief. It's compounding the grief that he has over the death of his father. Um, so I think there are moments where Hamlet flips and does use her, right? But he's only doing so because, um, she is presenting to him as though she doesn't have feelings for him. Right. So mm. it's this, it's, it's this tragic situation of the most awful miscommunication where a woman is being manipulated by powers that are, you know, beyond her, um, her reach and Hamlet is somehow caught up in the middle of it. And we have these two people who I believe are truly like, care for each other or, you know, are in love or, or have deep, deep affection for each other and are wanting to support each other, but they're caught up in the machinery of, of, of Denmark, right? And they are to a certain degree pawns that are pitted against each other. And, and, and they come to a point where they're just, they're just reacting because they're, they're puppets in many ways, right? Mm -hmm. 
But underneath it all, I think that there is this genuine like affection and, and love and care between them. Now, another in- interesting aspect of Hamlet, and I and I love talking Shakespeare with you, so I thank you so much for talking with me. Yeah, no, it's uh, great. Another aspect I found interesting about Hamlet is obviously there's that uh, later part of this, um, I think it's act three. I'm, I might be wrong in the exact act where he determines that he's going to try to convince everyone that he's insane. Uh-huh. So supposedly we're supposed to assume that he's fully in control of his own faculties. But given the events, you do wonder, is he truly in control of his own faculties? So when you're playing that, I mean, that's gonna be a very fine line to playing someone who's supposed to be in control, trying to play someone who's insane, but at the same time, doing his emotions and everything else, he isn't fully in control, it seems, on some level either. So how, I mean, that's a lot to play in one, you know, in one play. Yeah, it is, but Shakespeare does this brilliant thing where he gives Hamlet access to the audience through the soliloquies, where he has an opportunity to kind of let the audience in on what it is that he's doing. So he gets to have the best of both worlds, right? He gets to say like, I'm going to put on an antic disposition and fool all these, these jokers. Right. Um, But don't make no mistake. I'm just playing at it. But then of course, like the deeper that he goes and the more that forces that are outside of his control begin to work on him, the more that line gets blurred, right? So we have someone who sets out to play a very specific game and lets the audience in on the game that they're playing, but then eventually finds themselves caught up and kind of torn apart by the game that they've set out to play. It's a very, very difficult thing to to balance, but Shakespeare, um, I think, gives a really amazing anchor to actors by providing them with that, those soliloquies, you know, where he has the opportunity to uh, divulge his, his secret plots. Now, I think it's also very clear that you play both Laertes at one point and in Hamlet at one point. Um, Ham, uh, Laertes in, very, in a very real way is the dramatic foil for Hamlet. Now, when you're playing Laertes, are you playing it intentionally as a reflection of Hamlet or are you developing Laertes as his own individual, his own man? I mean, I, I think... I, I, as his own man, you know, it, it's it's hard. Again, this is going back to this idea about like the individualistic actor, right? The actor who is playing this specific role that is out on its own versus an actor that is part of an ecosystem that is telling a much larger, more complicated, interesting story. So while I believe that Laertes is his own man, Laertes is there to serve the story of Hamlet, right? So whatever choices that I'm making for one Laertes versus another is completely dependent upon the world that we are all agreeing to create, right? Um, But if I had to kind of say who I think Laertes is and why he does the things that he does, um, I could be very, very clear and say that he is de- he's deeply loyal to his family. He loves his sister. Um, they have a very, very special relationship. And he's a hot-headed, young, ambitious kid um, who, again, gets like caught up in the machinations of the state and can only follow the track that Shakespeare has laid for him, right? which is to come to come to a head with someone who I think he ultimately really respects um, might not have the greatest kind of relationship with him, but, but respects as a, as an individual. Um, and then we have the the tragic unfolding that we, that we have. Yeah. I really think it's great that you followed their tradition. It seems like in science fiction of uh, science fiction, fiction actors who also have this deep Shakespearean background. I'm thinking like got Patrick Stewart, Peter Macon mm. had that uh, Shakespearean background. Yeah. So, so what is it you think about um, sci-fi and Shakespeare that seems to go hand in hand so well in these, like the Orville's Star Trek, they seem to have that great deep connection. The first thing that I can think of is just the, the world building that takes place, right? Like with Shakespeare, we have the text on the page, but then we have these really elaborate, histories that are kind of underpinning these these stories and the stories are grand in and of themselves but that that anchoring history is so much broader and so much deeper and it's similar with i think sci-fi and and even um 
fantasy to a certain extent, right? Where you have so much um, world building taking place and so, uh, so many different um, kind of opportunities to flesh out worlds that may be tangential to the central world that is that that has um has been conceived right or or, or whatever i i think it really has to do with like history world building and um like the depth of character like when we think about shakespeare the the depth of character is so rich and so um emotionally saturated and i think that with the most successful uh, science fiction programs and worlds, it's the same, right? We have mm. these really, really rich characters um, who have the opportunity to, I think in television sp specifically because it's iterative, right? You're, you know, you're episode after episode, season after season. So the opportunities to expand and explore and go in mm. different directions, not only in the entire world, but within specific characters is you know limitless um it's only limited by the the studio's decision <laughs> to renew a series or not you know? <laughs> exactly. um, so i think it's you know i i think that it all has to do with like world building and depth of character and um and i you know and the kind of the the humanity the underlying humanity do you think that sci-fi shows and their actors get the credit they deserve for the complexity of the stories and the acting and everything that is involved in making one? I mean, I certainly think in, in the, the fandom and in the, the universe of sci-fi, they absolutely do. But I, to your point, I don't know, like outside of the genre itself, um, if it does always get the kind of credit and kudos that it, that it does deserve, you know, there are, I think, you know kind of perennial instances where that that does happen but by and large like in general i don't i don't know that it does now i read something really kind of interesting and let me know if you can confirm it or not um okay so i read that you were what it was called a jedi performance artist for luke skywalker in the book of boba fett is that true Yes, that is that that is true. Because I did not find that at all on the IMDb page. I was a little wasn't sure if where I found it was bullshit or not. But that's actually true. Yeah, if you um, if you watched, I think it was episode six or or seven of of Book of Boba Fett. Um, yeah, I get I get credited as the Jedi performance artist or performance artist Jedi. I think. Now, now what does that mean exactly? <laughs> Well, I, I this is the part of the conversation that I, I have to be silent about because I'm, <laughs> I'm under a, I'm under an NDA, so I, I can't really talk much about um, about the process or the project. But I would encourage folks to check out the the Disney Gallery of the Book of Boba Fett, where they go into a little bit of the uh, the tech behind how uh, how they created Luke Skywalker in that episode. Now, just out of once again, I, I know you gotta be careful how you answer the questions, but is the end does the NDA exist because your performance as uh, Luke, um, performance for Luke Skywalker is going to occur in a later series again, or just like in perpetuity, you just can never talk about it? It's kind of in perpetuity. I can never talk about it. Like I, I, I have no idea what is is happening in that universe. It's yeah no idea whatsoever all right now feel free to also um skip the question as well but i'm, I'm going to ask it when we talk about jedi performance artists are they talking similar to like andy circus as the golem or is there something different than that yeah i have to plead the fifth on that one. <laughs> fair enough <laughs> so, yeah fine we gotta find like a um a, a new language to talk with and like i don't know talking crow maybe they can't figure it out <laughs> That's <all> yeah <laughs> <laughs> now once again you may not be able to answer this question or not so how did you get involved in that role because i mean once again that's um i assume you have to c confirm a very physical aspect of a role um a lot to do with body language and that nature um how did that come about like what did they see or what did you um let's say um audition for to get to land that yeah it's a it's a it's a great question and um all i can really say was uh 
I didn't really understand what I had gotten myself into until <laughs> I was virtually coming to set and and was was shown exactly what it was that I would be doing and and who I would be doing it with. That's about all I can say. So very much a surprise through and through. Um, yeah, that I that I still am kind of wrapping my head around. <laughs> All right. So did whatever you did in Book of Boba Fett help you to prefer, prepare to be the Kalon primary in the Orville? So I um Kalon primary, at least the the first time when we when we meet him, that happened several years ago now, I want to say. Um so what was I, I can't really say that the work on on Boba Fett was informing any of Kalon primary. The similarities that they, I, the one similarity that they share was is that that it's um, it's not me, right? It's it's I'm I'm a, I'm a mask for for something else, right? So um, so there was very much kind of a a, a parallel working um focus around the body right um so yeah i would say that th those were the kind of similarities that the two performances shared but that's that's kind of it now you're credited as being both kalon primary and k1 mm -hmm. so should the view or the listeners infer that they're the same character <laughs> That's a good question. And it was one that was brought up on set. And uh, I don't know that there was ever a definitive answer one way or the other. I think that um, that that you could you could speculate that that K1, based on the way that he was treated, would naturally rise to become Kalon primary and exact his vengeance on on uh, on folks who had enslaved the Kalon. Mm. Um, but it was never, it was never explicitly spelled out for, for me or for anybody that was, that was working on set. That would be a question I think for, for Seth and John Kassar and, and everybody else who was working on the, on the script. Now, when you're playing um, the Kalon, you're both the voice and the actor in the suit or are they separate entities? Same. same. One of the same. So when, when you're playing K1 and let's say you also play the Kalen primary. Did you I mean were, were there any nuances to distinguish between an early Kalon to the more conquering Kalon later on that you added to either an assertiveness or whatever you did with those characters? Yeah, it's it's a good question. And um, you know, Seth and I talked about just different kind of subtle variations that we might be able to try. Cause I again started out with Kalon one several years ago. And then when the the K one story kind of came came up, um, that was a question that I asked initially, and it was it was um, the thing that we kind of came to was that like this is the prototype K one, right? So for lack of a better word, you know he's he's maybe a little bit stiffer than than an Isaac or mm. a Kalon primary, right? Um, not stiff in the sense that he needs like oil or anything like that, but just that um, he's, he's a prototype. So like he's a, he's the first iteration of this, uh, of this AI. Um, so it was uh, like how that manifested physically was just in kind of tighter movements, a little bit more of a uh, little bit more rigidity less i think as you see certainly in isaac and to a lesser degree in kalon primary there's less kind of fluidity in in the body movements i think that was kind of the main thing that we focused on to distinguish between k1 and kalon primary that being said kalon are a race of ai that are they want to be you know relatively uniform and in sync if you watch yeah. um the shots where there's multiple kalon they're all you know, they're all moving on the same clock. They have the same metabolism. So we definitely didn't want to stray from that. Um, and I think, you know, we ultimately did a, a pretty good job. Now, the interesting thing, and it must be the difficult thing about playing the Kalon, especially the Kalon primary, is that they're supposed to be in, entirely without emotion. I mean, not even like 
you know, like uh, Star Trek Next Generation had Data, who was supposed to be that much, but you always could see like the smirk and smile. I mean, also they showed he was cheating a little bit. Uh, <laughs> the Kalon, there's none of that. It's supposed to be a hundred percent no emotion. All you have really to act with is that is your voice. That's supposed to be kind of a, a times monotone. So, but how are you adding like little inflection emotion? So you weren't, you know, going beyond, you know, beyond the idea of their emotion, but at the same time still putting in enough. So there's the, the connection with the audience. Mm. Good question. Um, yeah, I think, I think the trap for the actor would be to, to, to think that I, I'm a robot, right? And, and, and by kind of going that route, you, you remove any intention, right? That a, that a being might have mm -hmm. moment to moment. And so it's somewhere in the middle. It's not like making him or, or coming from the perspective that this is a robot and it's not coming from the perspective that this is a fully fleshed human being with wants and desires. It's something in the middle, right? It is, it is a sentient being that has clear objectives, right? And so how am I rooting down into those objectives and understanding what is the driving force moment to moment? And that invariably like colors the delivery, it, it you know, creates the body language. Um, so again, it, 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 it's really kind of letting the voice and the body and the movements all kind of come from the inside out rather than saying, this is a robot, he needs to move like this or he needs to sound like that. Um, really kind of just going, okay, not a robot, not a human being, but a being that has very, very specific objectives that they are going for. What are they and how are they going about getting them in this specific moment, in this specific scene? Now, one thing about when you're watching Isaac on the Orville, who is the one that the audience is, is a Kalon that we're most familiar with because obviously, you know, main character. Um they keep playing with the idea that once again, that he has no emotions, but that he, but they keep introducing the concept that he does, um, you know, like the suicide there's um, falling. He probably falls in love with that. Um, the the doctor, depending on what, what your Claire would depend on what your point of view is. Now, when you're playing, when you're playing um, the Kalan primary, is that something you're also thinking about? Does he actually have emotions and they're trying to ignore him or stifle him? Or are you playing straight as, um, sentient, one zeros, um, objective, um, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think the latter, you know, it's, um, I think the journey that we get to see with Isaac is, is the potential, like the, 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 the discovering that one has potential for human emotion or Kalon emotion, however you want to describe it. And I think that, um, that potential exists for Kalon primary. He just hasn't been on the journey that Isaac has been on. Um, but you get to see, I think in the penultimate episode um, where Kalon primary maybe begins to maybe, maybe, maybe some of that understanding starts to like sprout up a little bit, right. When he sees what Ensign Burke does for, um, for the, the team and, um, and he kind of, reconciles more and more Isaac's journey um, against like everything that, that he has been, Kalen primary has been about the entire race has been about. So it's, it's not that um, it's not that Kalon are all inherently capable of emotion, but they have, there, there is that potential, right. That exists. And I, which I think again, going back to your question around sci-fi and Shakespeare it's really rooted in that humanity, right? In, in, in our potential for something that is greater than what we currently are, mm -hmm. you know, which is so, I think, um, moving and powerful and, and exciting about a character or a story. Now, one thing I really like about the Orville is that with the Kalon Primer, you have that issue, the, the episode Domino, where he kind of does have that realization that you mentioned, but they do have, he has that one more episode after the last episode where he shows up again. Um, he shows up um, as you know, as 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 a, a member of um, not a member, but on the good side, let's say, or whatever, as an ally. Now, when you played that at that episode, what were your conscious decisions to show that there was that transition from the the Kalen that we knew Domino prior to the one post? 
Yeah, I, I don't know that any of the um, the decisions that were made like registered on screen, you know, <laughs> um, but my thinking around it was it was it, it kind of centered on this the hilarious scene that that I think Steph wrote about um, Isaac explaining what marriage was to Kalon Primary and Kalon Primary saying like this is your this is enslavement like you're going right <laughs> back to what we were trying to get away from like what are you doing. Um, but again, part of this journey and like where Isaac may be having this emotional awakening and and moving further into his relationship with Claire, the realization for Kalon Primary may have been that, uh, again, that the world is not as, as I thought it was, right? Mm -hmm. That there is... Um, um there's more to these humans than meets the eye so to speak and so again it's like him deciding to come to the ceremony the, the wedding um and just be being present there is is enough right mm -hmm. like he is he is showing up and being there and exposing himself to something that is completely alien to him um is i think the first or second or third step in this in what could be um a journey that's akin to isaac's emotional awakening hopefully in season four <laughs> that must <laughs> which, 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 which uh, must happen and i will say though that scene about marriage was so funny because i am married and i was watching it with my wife and i i laughed way harder than i probably should have <laughs> my wife looked at me like you best <laughs> yeah. i had a very similar moment when i when i got the sides and i was sharing them with my wife and and we we both had a, a good chuckle at it <laughs> i mean she was she's a big fan of the show and yeah it was it was a lot of fun so in your opinion um when, when, you, th when you think about the k-line obviously we all know from when you're playing uh, k uh k1 that they sought independence because of the abuse and the treatment of their makers now in your opinion would they have sought independence regardless because they were eventually heading towards full sentience or do you think that they needed that trigger in order to go off on their own explore themselves or whatever wow what a good question um i don't i don't know which is to say that like it wasn't communicated to me by any of the the creatives you know the right, producers right, right. Or anything like that but I think it would probably be uh, the latter, right? That they needed some type of trauma in order to initiate the journey that they ultimately ended up on, you know, which led them to roving the galaxy, looking for species that were hell bent on their own destruction and just eradicating them so that they wouldn't turn around and become a threat to right, right. Kalon. Um, but I don't know. It's a great question. You know, it kind of, just the idea of trauma does suggest they have far more emotions or deeper emotions than they're willing to admit to. And mm -hmm. I mean, of course, if, if I was a, if I was a therapist, I'd be like, well, maybe that's why they try so hard to pretend they don't have any because what's underneath is shit because of the, what happened to their lifetime. But I thought that was an amazing storyline that, or that uh, Seth McFarlane wrote in the Orville. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it could have been, I mean, the, you know, Seth is, is operating on a lot of different levels and and you know what we get on the screen is not necessarily always what's written on the page um but i know that a lot goes into it and i, I you know when you're on a tv set like there's so much going on especially on a show like orville where there's all of these crazy um elements um that there always isn't the time to kind of unpack these mm -hmm. worlds and really kind of dive deep into the philosophical um, kind of underpinnings or what feel like philosophical underpinnings, um, which is something that I would, I would love to do. Got to do it a little bit with the cast over drinks from time to time, but, um, but never on the scale with the, uh, with the producers and the folks who created this amazing world. Uh, really the cast gets it, when you guys were out for drinks, you would chat about all that stuff. I mean, yeah, to a certain degree we would. Yeah. I think, you know, it would come up because again, like the world of the Orville is so is so rich right and it can and it and it goes it can go so deep in different ways mm. um so it was always it, it would always come up whenever i had the opportunity to hang out with the cast kind of you know um off a set um just that the depth of story the humanity 
uh, it always made for really, really interesting conversations, you know, and speculations about where the story was going to go, backstory, all of that kind of stuff. So, which you don't have to answer, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Who then in the cast is the biggest Orville nerd about the Orville? Seth. Seth. <laughs> I guess that makes sense. Okay, beyond outside Seth of the other cast members, the, yeah. the nine uh, producer cast members. Um. Ah, uh, let's see. Uh. Yeah, I don't, I honestly don't know. Probably Scott. Scott? <laughs> yeah, probably Scott. <laughs> That's cool. I mean, he at least seemed to know the most about like the world and he was, you know, seemed to be the most opinionated and um, yeah, yeah. But I don't know. You know, I have to say like it was, I've been on, you know, my share of, of sets before, worked on my share of shows and everything and this set was very special in that the cast was really bonded. They really cared about each other. They care about the work. Um, it was a lot of fun. I mean, like really grueling at times, no doubt. Mm -hmm. um, but the affection among among cast members, as far as I could tell, was was really genuine and, and a lot of fun to be around. That's cool. I mean, I, I had um, the the good fortune to have met uh, Peter Macon on, on, on my show and then I got. I actually went to Terrific and I was able to meet um, um, Adrian. I think it's, it's um, Adrian uh -huh. Palicki, and th they do seem very cool. It, it must have been quite the pleasure to to bait and argue Arville with, <laughs> with those two. <laughs> it really was. So, what has it been like for you to be part of the Orville family? Not only at, from the actor standpoint, from but the fandom as well. I mean, I mean, what 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 has that been like for you? Is, you, is it, has it been like? Do you feel? Like, is it a, do you feel the embrace of it? Is it stifling? Is it exciting? No, it's, I, you know, it's wonderful. It's, uh, it's always, um, humbling to, uh, to be open to the, the genuine responses from, from folks who are, who are taking in work that you're a part of, you know, it's, it's, um, it's always very humbling, you know, like I, I, uh, I get people who really invest themselves in these worlds and these stories. Um, and so I feel, I feel honored to be a part of, of that journey um, as, as an actor for Graham, you know, just being someone who gets to work with amazing people on amazing projects, but also as just Graham, a guy who gets to be a part of, um, you know, the mythology that, um that someone like yourself is is taking so you know deeply to heart and cares so much about you know it's it's a real it's a joy you know so once again there's no way of truly knowing but in your gut do you think there's a season four coming or not i really don't know um i sure hope so it would be a lot of fun you know i mean it's the, all seasons are streaming now on disney plus you know so that's amazing um but I really have no idea. Like I, I don't have my finger on the pulse of, of, uh, of what's happening with, with the show. I think, I mean, it has, uh, it has all the, um, I mean, just based on the last season and how epic it was and how successful it was, like, I don't know what other proof an executive needs to make a decision about, yeah. about green lighting a fourth season. Cause it's all there. Um, but I, I have no idea what's what's going to happen, you know, and as just a general kind of practice for myself, like once a project's done, it's in the past. That's it. It'll never happen again until it does, you know, and that's kind of the, the mental and emotional space that mm. that I need to occupy and and carry forward. So what's next for you? I don't know. Right now, there's uh, there's not a whole lot going on. Um, yeah, I don't know. I've got a couple of projects that I'm that I'm playing around with and um we'll see where they where they go from here. But nothing concrete at the moment. Yeah, I'm just I'm just along for the ride. 
Well, when you're ready to talk about something, come right back in the show. I'd be glad to talk about it. And we're talking Luke Skywalker at some point. <laughs> so, so thank you so much, Mr. Hamilton. You've been awesome. And it was, it was a pleasure talking with you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Take care. You too.